Hi, thanks for joining. My name is Graeme Charters. I'm a senior technical staff member at IBM and I'm the Liberty, Liberty Technical Offering Manager, so responsible for WebSphere Liberty and Open Liberty. Um, my co speaker today is Reza Rahman. He's a principal program manager at Microsoft and he's responsible for uh, enterprise Java in the Azure cloud. Uh, the topic we've got today is explore Jakarta EE and MicroProfile on Azure with Open Liberty and OpenShift. Uh, so essentially what we'll be looking at is uh, how to take existing Java EE, Jakarta EE, MicroProfile applications, running them on Liberty and running them inside containers in OpenShift in the managed Azure, uh, the Azure managed OpenShift environment. So I'll start by um, presenting a few slides, talk a little bit about Java EE, Jakarta EE, MicroProfile, uh, a little bit about Liberty and why I would recommend Liberty, other than the fact that I'm the offering manager for the technology, uh, and also a bit about why the collab why we're collaborating. So why IBM and Microsoft are collaborating uh, to to enable uh, these applications in the Azure cloud. Uh, Reza will then take over and do a demo. So that's the kind of meat of the session. He'll take about 20 minutes uh, doing a demo of the technology, and then we'll talk a little bit little bit about uh, where we're going next or where we'd like to go next um, with the collaboration. Uh, wrap things up and then leave you with a few with a slide with a few links on for other information. So um, you can take a screenshot of that if you like at the end, but also the slide should be available for download. Okay, so Jakarta and MicroProfile. So if you've been around um, Java for a few years now, you'll be aware of Java EE. Um, Java EE started out in the late 1990s and evolved over the next kind of 15 to 20 years, uh, and it it gained great adoption, huge adoption within the industry. Um, it was established as a set of uh, open standards, a set of standards um, collaborating, uh, collaborated on by a number of vendors uh, that gave you portability of enterprise applications across different server runtime implementations. And that proved very popular. Uh, and then in more recently, um, Oracle donated the technology to the Eclipse Foundation and Jakarta EE was formed. So Jakarta EE is the kind of, um, the path forward for Java EE is the way we're going to evolve the Java EE specifications going forward. So it gives you um, a way to essentially protect your investment in your existing Java EE technology. There's a path forward through the, the Jakarta EE standards. Um, but also Jakarta EE is a way to build, build modern portable enterprise applications. And there are a number of products that implement Jakarta EE. During, uh, during, well, during the development of, of uh, latter, latter stages of Java EE and, pri and prior to Jakarta EE, um, a group of vendors and uh, Java user groups and, and users of the technology got together and formed uh, a group called MicroProfile. Uh, and this was set up to define standards for cloud native micro Java microservices. Um, it was quickly donated to the Eclipse Foundation and has evolved uh, a great deal since then. Um, so. J Java EE, Jakarta EE, and, uh, and MicroProfile are very complementary. MicroProfile builds on a subset of the Jakarta EE technologies to give you a kind of place to evolve your enterprise applications into the microservice world. And again, there are a, num a number of implementations of the MicroProfile technologies. So we, uh, in the Liberty organization, we support and have supported MicroProfile from the beginning, uh, and we have implementations of Jakarta EE and Java EE as well. Um, so why would you choose Liberty as a, as a runtime for these applications? Well, we spent uh, the past few years making Liberty an excellent runtime for, for cloud-based uh, cloud applications, cloud-native applications. Um, so the first couple of reasons are all about uh, trying to essentially save you cost and save you time. Um, so Liberty is, is a, a lightweight runtime, a modular runtime, and you can pick, pick just the components you need in support of your application. Um, and so that helps you reduce the disk, uh, disk footprint and memory footprint um, when you're running applications, if they're uh, potentially if they're smaller applications. Also, Liberty is a very efficient runtime, so it has high throughput. And when we combine that with the memory footprint savings that we get through the OpenJ9 JVM, um, then we get a very, uh, very competitive uh, runtime capability. So Liberty, for example, if we run Spring Boot applications on Liberty rather than Tomcat, you can essentially cut your cloud costs or your on-prem data center costs um, down to a quarter. 
Um, if you compare running traditional enterprise applications on runtimes like Wildfly, I think the, the savings, are, uh, it's down to about a third or a quarter. Also, the, we've optimized the runtime in terms of cloud delivery and also um, as you evolve towards doing continuous integration, continuous delivery, the runtime actually fits very well with those methodologies. So we support a, uh, APIs that help you integrate with Kubernetes environment. The runtime is self-tuning, so you don't have to tune it anymore for the environment you're going to deploy into, which is great if you're moving it around from, uh, from one environment to another. Uh, and also if the environment changes over time. Um, in terms of continuous delivery, we, we release the runtime every four weeks. It's a full release and we roll in security fixes. So you, you it means you don't build technical debt up because you can pick the latest release and you've got the latest security fixes as, as, fixes as, as part of that. We also have zero migration, which means that you don't have to migrate anymore. If you, if you keep your application the same and if you keep your server configuration the same, you can run on one version and then the next version and then the next version. And there's no need to migrate. We don't break the APIs. We don't break the server configuration. And then lastly, developer experience. We focused a lot on trying to streamline the developer experience and also make it work very well for containerized deployments. So um, we have a rapid in a loop capability that lets you essentially make code, uh, small co make code changes, make uh, configuration changes, and those are automatically reflected in a running, uh, running application in your server. Um, we also have container, uh, that capability uh, supported with containers so you can get uh, true to, do true to production development. So why are IBM and Microsoft collaborating? Well, if you look at the, uh, the cloud computing study from IDG last year, um, over half of the applications that are running in the cloud actually started out on-premise or on-premises. Um, so that, that means that these are applications that were written, probably written to be deployed on-prem, not for the cloud and have been moved to the cloud. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of Java -y applications doing that, a lot of Jakarta -y applications going that route. Uh, also, 55% of uh, uh, customers uh, use or clients are using multiple clouds or enterprises are using multiple clouds. So this is why it makes sense for us to demonstrate the use of OpenShift. OpenShift gives you that layer so you can be uh, can essentially have a common uh, operational capability across different public clouds, but also on premise. And then lastly, 54% of apps are originated on cloud. There are a lot of applications being written for cloud and still being moved to the cloud. And in fact, enterprises believe that, or 59% of enterprises believe that most or all of their, app, uh, their applications will be running on the cloud by the end of this year. So that's the kind of intro. Uh, I'll hand it over now to, to Reza to do the demo. Basically, the first tangible thing that we've been able to produce so far is what we'll show you today. Uh, and that is basically uh, a set of uh, joint uh, guidance uh, to get uh, Open Liberty and Western Liberty uh, working on Azure Red Hat OpenShift. Now, uh, obviously, Graeme has talked to you uh, a, a lot, uh, quite a bit already about Open Liberty and Western Liberty. So we won't talk too much about that uh, in uh, right now. I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift. So basically, Azure Red Hat OpenShift is a fully managed uh, uh, OpenShift environment on Azure. It's co developed by uh, Microsoft and Red Hat. Uh, so basically, this is a set of instructions that uh, it takes those technologies and, and puts them together and incorporates the best practices uh, that we believe from um, the Microsoft and IBM side. Uh, I won't go through the entire set of instructions here, but I will give you a brief walkthrough of, of what we have. Uh, and this is just the beginning. There's a, there's a lot more uh, coming to this. So uh, there are a few things that you need to set up. Obviously, you need a you need an Azure environment. You need an Azure environment set up with uh, with uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, there's several steps here that are pretty non-trivial. A lot of it is simplified, but still, you're putting together a number of different pieces. So there is some work to be done here. And basically, this instructions makes it very easy instead of customers needing to figure out on their own how to do all these intricate steps. We've just basically written it down and said, hey, this is this is the fastest way you can get this up and running. So you need to create the OpenShift cluster. You need to set up some permissions uh, to with it. You need to set up the Azure Red Hat console, which I'll show you in just a moment. You need to connect to it. Uh, and you need to do a little bit of a setup step uh, as what's what's called the cube admin, basically the administrative account for uh, a given uh, Azure Red Hat deployment. But you don't really want to be doing 
the real work as uh, cube admin. Obviously, that poses some uh, security risks. So there are some other things you need to do in order to enable sort of an ad application admin or application developer, if you will. So those steps are also outlined here. Uh, I've, just to save a bit of time, I've already done all of those steps uh, behind the scenes for us. Uh, it takes a, it took me about, I think, all in all, about 45 minutes. It's not too too bad, and the majority of that is actually just deploying um, Azure Red Hat OpenShift because it takes it takes a little bit to spin, uh, spin that up in. Um, uh, initially, once you're up and running, then it's a smooth experience, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, we are using the uh, no, OpenShift is a fully full fledged environment on its own, right? So um, it does come with a number of things instead of the runtime, and it's not just a runtime per se. It's not just a simple facade over Kubernetes. For example, it does come with a built in uh, Docker registry. And in fact, the Docker that Docker registry is what we recommend using in this case. So you need to set that up there. Uh, I need to set up the namespace as we mentioned. So this is a space for the little space for the application to work in, and I'll show you the namespace in, in just a moment. Uh, and of course, you need to set up the administrator. So uh, I'll give you a brief tour here. I'm the administrator of this application, if you will. So I'm not running as cube admin. I could, right? As so I could log out here and log in as cube admin. Uh, that's not what I really want to be doing. So if you look here, there's a number of projects that I have access to, including the actual uh, Kubernetes cluster that uh, that OpenShift is running on. So instead of doing that, I'm just logging in as the application admin. In this case, myself. Uh, so you're going to integrate actually with Azure Active Directory in order to do that. So I'll just, uh, th this is me. And here I am. Okay. So that's the that's the setup of, uh, of the applic so-called application admin. Uh, you do need to install the OpenShift operator. I'll show you the OpenShift, uh, or, or rather, the Open Liberty operator on OpenShift. Uh, I, I do have that set up already. You need to do that as cube admin. Uh, and I'll talk about the capabilities of, of the operator. But basically, the operator makes uh, the bridges a gap between uh, Open Liberty as a runtime, uh, um, if you will, uh, more specifically, Open Liberty as a as a single instance, uh, and sort of brings that uh, concept into uh, a Kubernetes and OpenShift cluster. So now you have basically have a cluster capable, a, a, a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, or and an OpenShift cluster. Uh, that can integrate natively with with Open Liberty, if you will, and uh, it does a number of interesting things, like even uh, providing you traces and drum dumps in a cluster-aware fashion. Uh, we'll talk I'll show you about that uh, all that in a moment as well. But basically, the basic basic gist is we have the operator installed, so my cluster is now, if you will, Liberty enabled. So uh, you need to do all of those steps, and then you, you get to uh, preparing the application. I actually have an application prepared, and I'll show you. Uh, I'll, I'll basically uh, show you the simple deployment cycle for doing that. Uh, the the uh, guidance does come with a simple application. Uh, I'll be showing you a variant of that. It's a little bit more, a uh, little bit more to it than this than this application here. So I actually won't go uh, through much of this uh verbatim you you should feel free to take a look at that the whole point is to uh, actually enable you to do all of these things the only thing that i wanted to show you is sort of this graphic here that re represents very well what we are actually doing so azure is the public cloud that you're running on you're running uh, azure red hat uh, openshift instance uh so an openshift instance within red hat within azure within that under the hood there is a kubernetes cluster uh, and then within that, you're running a Docker uh, container, uh, and Open Liberty is within this Docker container, and within Open Liberty is your Java E application. So there's a sort of a layer cake uh, or Russian doll uh, effect, if you will, if you will here. Okay, so I think uh, that's enough of the uh, guidance. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, sort of keep that open just in case I need it, although I probably won't. So this is the Azure uh, portal. Uh, so I'm logged on to the portal. Uh, as I said, I, I've saved a little bit of time by creating a few things ahead of time. I hope I can show you some of that. Let me see if I can. The font is probably tiny. Uh, so let me see how much I can increase the font uh, while still things still being reasonably visible. Let's see. And I think that's as far as I get. So I need to minimize down a little bit. OK, so what I have created here is the uh, virtual network that uh, uh, OpenShift runs within. So this is the uh, uh, Azure Virtual Network. There's the cluster. There's the OpenShift cluster, as you can see. Uh, and then I have also created a, a simple uh, managed Postgres instance. 
this is the Postgres instance that this uh, demo application will be connecting to. So I've created those things uh, ahead of time. Uh, as I mentioned, I've also set up uh, open the OpenShift uh, uh, ad administrator. So if you haven't seen this before, this is basically the OpenShift console vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Azure console. So this is me as the application administrator. Uh, so I've got a, uh, I've got access to a couple of different resources. One is the namespace where the where I'll be deploying the application. It's called Open Liberty Demo, very unimaginative, if you will. Uh, and then there's I, I also need access to the registry. So the built-in Docker registry that I'm going to publish out my image into, and I'll show you step-by-step uh, -step all, of, all of that as well. So just to show you, the operator is here is also installed here. Uh, wrong uh, flow, sorry. So if I go here and go to install operators, uh, you'll see that within my application namespace, Project Open Liberty Demo, uh, I have the uh, Open Liberty uh, Open Liberty operator installed, and we'll actually be doing the deployment and on de on deployment and all of those things through the Liberty operator. So it's aware of again aware of the cluster of uh, Open Liberty instances. And as you can see, there is uh, Open Liberty application. If I go in here, I'll be able to essentially create and manage the applications there. Uh, I'll be able to get a, a trace and dump, which I won't show here, but it's actually uh, reasonably easy to do that as well. So without further ado, let me uh, show you the application. So here's the application. Uh, you can go and download, uh, like I said, uh, part of the instructions is the application. This is a slightly different version of it. So I, ha I have it set up in Eclipse. I'm an IDE user, I'll, I'll have to admit. Uh, yeah, I pretty much try to stay in the IDE as much as I can. It's a simple Maven project that I have. Uh, I've loaded up loaded up in, in Eclipse. Uh, I also have loaded up in Eclipse an Open Liberty server instance that's running on localhost. I just want to just want to show you that the application works locally. So here's the Palm XML. I won't go through it too much. It's a very typical. In this case, I, I chose to use Java E. Uh, it could be Jakarta E, Java E, uh, micro profile, some combination thereof, whatever it is that you need that uh, that Liberty supports very well. But in this case, it's a very typical Java E application. It's representative. It has all, basically all of the moving pieces. Uh, so I just have one dependency, and that's it. Right. So uh, I'll go ahead and build my uh, my application here. So run as uh, Maven clean. Just want to make sure nothing gets messed up because I've been playing around with it uh, all morning, trying to make sure the demo works smoothly. And I'm just going to do a Maven install. This will build my WAR file. Okay. So the WAR file is ready, ready, set to go. It's uh, sitting in my target directory, as you can see right here. Okay, so I'm going to now right click. Uh, I'm going to close up the POM XML. There's nothing really much to see here. I won't show you too much of the application code, but it's basically Java E code for the most part. So run as, uh, run on server, and that's going to spin up my Liberty instance. It should be spinning up. I'm doing a cold start. Uh, a few years ago, people wouldn't imagine you could do this with a Java E uh, runtime, but it's very, very doable. In fact, you'll see that. Uh, when I run, when I do this in Docker, it's going to be even faster, uh, and I'll tell you why it's uh, even faster all as well. So, just wait for uh, Liberty to spin up here. Okay, should be deploying my application right about now. Okay, there it is. My application is deployed. Okay, I never liked the Eclipse built-in browser, so I'm going to uh, pull this up in a real browser. Okay, and. And there's my application. Pretty simple stuff. It's nothing sophisticated. It's just a simple crud application. It does. It is using a, a database behind the scenes. I'll uh, delete myself here just to demonstrate. Uh, and it is uh, talking to the that uh, Azure Postgres instance running behind the scenes. Uh, it is running JPA CDI EJB uh, 3.2 Lite, uh, and it also has a JSF front end. But in addition to the JSF front end, there is also a REST interface. So if I go to REST, coffee is here. Uh, that's the backend REST interface. You can uh, either output XML or JSON. In this case, I just chose to uh, show JSON, uh, rather XML by default, because I personally find it a bit more readable. OK, so that's it. I'm going to shut down uh, the Liberty instance. Stop. Uh, and now let's uh, go and do some other stuff here. So before we can. Uh, do anything else to the to this application? We have to build it, right? Uh, so we we build a WAR file. The WAR file, if I do uh, an ls in in my uh, directory structure here, uh, it is in in the, in the target directory. The WAR file is deployed. So I won't be able to uh, deploy it as a WAR file though. 
uh, in order to deploy it onto OpenShift, I need to build a Docker container first. So I need to Dockerize the application. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, the command to do that is here. Don't worry about it. If you can read this, this is sort of my cheat sheet for uh, the script for the for our demo today, if you will. So I'm going to just run this Docker build command. So this is going to build my Docker image. I'll show you the Docker uh, the Docker uh, uh, file uh, the Docker file uh, configuration in a moment. So I'll build the Docker image. Should build very very quickly. Uh, there is this configure.sh script, which is very interesting. I'll, I'll talk about that in, in just a moment for you here. Uh, in fact, as this is going on, uh, which won't take long, I'll, let me show you the Docker file. It's very simple. Uh, it starts with the Open Liberty kernel. Okay, so this is the min minimalistic thing that you can start with Open Liberty for. Uh, and there's a number of things in the server.xml. I'll show you the server.xml while we're at it as well. So here's a, here's a uh, server.xml that I'm using for this application. As you can see, I've, uh, I've explicitly specified the exact components that I need, the exact parts, uh, in this case, parts of uh, Java E or Jakarta E that I need. Uh, and that is actually what the configure.sh script is doing and a bit more. I'll talk about that in a, in a second too. So that's the server.xml. Uh, I'm copying over the database because I'm talking to the database and then finally copying over my war file and that's it. So what this configure.sh script does is that it tries to optimize uh, whatever the deployment is, specifically so looking at the server.xml file uh, and try to uh, make it such that it minimizes your memory footprint and startup time when you when you dockerize the application. And you'll see it, as I, as I told you, when I run the Docker image, you'll see how much faster it actually is than running, uh, running it locally on through Eclipse. So hopefully by now it should definitely be done. Yeah, it is. Uh, the next step, actually, I'm going to just uh, validate that everything is working by running the, the Docker image. It also serves to uh, show you sort of that configure.sh step and what it does. So we'll just uh, run the Docker image just locally now. And that's it. So it's much faster and it is up and running on localhost port 8080 once again. If I refresh this page, uh oh, and that's not good. Oh, I see. I I I, I didn't. Uh, I purposely did this to demonstrate to you that it's actually a different deployment, and then I forgot about it. So I'm just gonna uh, exit it via the uh, root root path, and there's the same application. So uh, this is running via the Docker container. So still everything is working just fine. So I'll just Control C out of this. All right, so there's a there's a Docker image. So next thing I need to do is I need to take this Docker image and I need to put it somewhere where uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes can can uh, reach it. And what I'm going to use is actually the built-in registry. So I have the built-in registry URL all set up here. So I'm going to just go ahead and tag this newly created image. Okay, and I'm going to push it to the to the registry, and this should take just a moment here. So tagging the image, or rather pushing the image at this point. So I am pushing it into the built-in, remember the built-in uh, registry that I talked about in, uh, just uh, towards the beginning of my demo. So hopefully my push will begin shortly here. And in fact, it's quite quick because I already did this in, in the morning. So uh, the push is, oh dear, uh, unauthorized Docker authentication required. So I'm going to need to authenticate myself with, with the, so I've been, I've timed out in the Docker registry. So I need to go up and actually make sure that I'm logged on onto the Docker registry. So here's where uh, the instructions come in handy. And as you, we all know, you know, this all this has to happen. That uh, inevitably you always have uh, some adventures while doing live demos. All right. So uh, that should work, and I just need to get my container registry URL, which I will do. Have that right here. All right. Good. Uh, you must be logged on to the server unauthorized. Okay. Okay. Maybe I need to log on to the project itself. So let me go ahead and do that. So I need to come in here copy login command, EAD, display token. And I'm, I'm basically, all I'm doing is I'm logging on to, logging into OC 
or rather the, the OpenShift uh, command line by doing this. Hopefully that will solve the problem here. So let me log in as myself. Okay, so uh, that should now be done. So let, let's retry the Docker login command now. So that's different. So hopefully I'm logged in now. Hopefully now I can push it. Okay, and here we go. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, so this should go re relatively quickly. Uh, so uh, the main thing I'm pushing here is really the the uh, configure dot the output of the configure.sh file. And you'll notice it's pretty small. Uh, all in all, it's just about 46 megs uh, for my application. So that includes my includes my war file as well. So let's see if this is uh, the push finishes. Push is done. OK, excellent. So you do need a YAML file, a, a descriptor and, uh, for OpenShift to deploy the application. I'll talk you through this in a, in a moment. So let, no more Docker file. So this is a YAML file, and we'll talk you through it uh, in just a moment. So let's go ahead. And so the application is now pushed into the Docker, Docker repository. We're going to go ahead and, and actually install the application. So we're going to go to the Open Liberty application uh, command here. Okay, and say oh, create open liberty application, which is basically deploy a new application. Uh, and I'm going to go to the YAML view. I could have used the UI view, but I have the YAML handy already, so I'm just going to use the YAML uh, file that I've pre-written and paste it on here. Uh, hopefully, you can see this text. If not, I'm going to try to maybe try to minimize this or maximize this a little bit more so you can see it. You know, what? I'm going to just going to show you this uh, in Eclipse, uh, just to show you the syntax. OK, so here's the syntax. Uh, and this is a type of open liberty application. This is referring to the operator. So we're asking the operator to do a deployment in this case. So we're giving it a name. Our application's name is very imaginative called Java e Cafe. This is a namespace. So this is a namespace I'm already working on. I have two instances of open liberty learning. This is what the replica equals two is referring to. And this is the application that I'm pulling from the from the Docker registry. Okay. And I'm simply saying expose equals true. This is pretty handy. So this is automatically creating uh, an HTTP endpoint that I can access uh, for, uh, immediately just by setting up the uh, expose equals true. Now, other than the, you know, basically making open liberty uh, natively work uh, in an in a Kubernetes and uh, OpenShift cluster, this is also very handy, right? So the equivalent of doing this in uh, in raw Kubernetes is pretty verbose. It would be at least three or four times uh, the size of this. So this is also a nice aspect of uh, the operators is they make these YAML files much more compact and actually almost a DSL, not quite. There's still some things that are uh, a little bit verbose, but still pretty pretty close to a DSL in terms of describing what you're actually trying to do. So I'm just going to go back into my, uh, my OpenShift console here, and I'm going to flip back to the form view so you can see the values a little bit better. So name is Java e Cafe. Uh, I haven't really specified a label for this. Uh, application image is uh, cafe v2, as you can see. I want two replicas of this. You can uh, scale it up and up and down. In fact, you can do this in runtime as well. I'll show you that in a moment as well. I'm just going to go ahead and hit create. Okay. So when I hit create, you'll see the Java e cafe uh, uh, application here. I'm going to uh, bump back into it and go to resources. So you can, you'll be able to see a bunch of uh, different information here. Uh, I could set up auto scaling. I could potentially edit uh, ed edit the uh, the application deployment after it's been deployed if I wanted to. So I'll go to the resources for now. So there's three different types of resources that were created: the deployment itself, the service to expose the the deployment uh, to the ex out outside world, and then an OpenShift route. Right. So the route is where I'm going to go, and this is what's going to give me the URL to access this application. So here it is. This is the location. So let's see if the application is up and running already. It may or may not be. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So as you can see, very, very fast deployment cycle. Right. So this is the same application with the same database, but this is a, a public URL, as you can see. All right. Uh, Undeploying is just as easy. So I can go back to home projects, open Liberty demo, uh, installed operators, Liberty application. Again, I could, re I could request uh, a dump or a trace from here as well. I'm just going to do just an on deploy. And in fact, I, I do that from here. 
here's my open liberty application and i'll just delete yep okay so that's it uh basically if i hit here it should be gone yeah so it doesn't exist anymore all right so it's as simple as that uh in in terms of uh the deployment i think it's a pretty smooth experience all in all uh given the power and complexity of some of the underlying power and complexity of some of these technologies so i'm going to hand it back over to uh over to graham now to talk a bit about our roadmap so what we just showed you as i as i mentioned is just the beginning uh there's a lot more to come thanks reza um that was a great demo and i thought you coped with the demo gremlins admirably <laughs> <laughs> I've I've been there myself. Um, okay, so in terms of where next, um, so Reza mentioned that uh, uh, we're looking to do more around the collaboration. We have kind of have this view of uh, the, the kind of ideal view is we we have customers who use traditional WebSphere and they're deploying on-prem today in virtual machines and they're looking to modernize those applications. Uh, to to Liberty, either WebSphere Liberty or Open Liberty, and what we'd like to do is kind of enable that experience. If they've chosen Azure as their cloud cloud of choice, and then we want to enable them to get to to their desired modern destination. Um, so we're looking at things like um, deploying traditional WebSphere applications in virtual in Azure virtual machines, making the, the the modernization tools available, so Transformation Advisor available in in Azure to help them. Uh, analyze those applications and plan uh, deployments uh, to WebSphere Liberty or Open Liberty. We're also looking at things like um, some some customers who aren't doing um, hybrid cloud, aren't looking at uh, at OpenShift as a solution across multiple clouds, um, are considering uh, or or are choosing native Kubernetes services, so the, the Azure Kubernetes service. So looking at uh, providing uh, guidance and capabilities around that, and then there's then there's the things you integrate with. So Reza mentioned um, database uh, as your Postgres. Um, there's on-prem database to be considered. So if you've got DB2, for example, on-premises and you're wanting to integrate with that when you deploy your applications into the cloud, we're looking at things like that. But also then integration with either services within OpenShift or services um, within, within the Azure cloud. So native services like Azure Active Directory and so on. Um, so the, those are the th kind of th areas we're looking at. We'd be interested to hear from you if any of those are of interest. Um, help us kind of prioritize our act activities and maybe we can let you know when when things become available. Um, so in terms of, of just to wrap things up, um, so we talked a bit about Java e, the evolution of Java e to Jakarta e, and how MicroProfile helps complement those technologies um, for doing cloud native microservices. Um, we talk, talked a little bit about Liberty um, as the runtime for those technologies and how the the uh, Open Liberty operator helps you and, and Reza showed how it helps you um, with simplifying deployment to the Azure managed OpenShift environment, makes it really, really simple. Um, as I said, expect more from the, the collaboration between IBM and Microsoft, uh, more guidance uh, and hopefully um, some additional capabilities coming soon. Um, in terms of where you can find out more information, um, there's links there to the docs that Reza was showing. So we've got the, the Azure OpenShift documentation. We've also got links to samples. And then there are links there to a number of uh, useful uh, Liberty resources. So a few articles about Liberty and how, how, to, how it relates to other runtimes and so on. Um, information about, uh, about strategies for modernization and then links out to Open Liberty and guides, uh, which are short tutorials to help you learn technologies. Um, Reza, you've got anything to add or we'll go on to questions? Uh, no, just a, a minor point uh, to add. So uh, we're starting off with guidance, right? So, uh, you know, the, the, yep. th the things that we're producing right now is how to run uh, Open Liberty and Western Liberty on ARO. Um, shortly, we'll be releasing Open Liberty uh, guidance for Open Liberty and Western Liberty on Kubernetes. So there was a question around: Is this an OpenShift operator? It is an it is a Kubernetes operator. Uh, it is functioning in, in in an OpenShift environment in this given setting, but the same operator is equally applicable in in native Kubernetes as well. Uh, so aside from the guidance, though, we do want to uh, improve this experience even further, right? So the guidance, as you saw, it, it's workable. It's not uh, terrible, but it is nonetheless there's some manual effort there. 
So there is a mechanism in Azure that's called the Azure Marketplace Solutions, and that abstracts out all of these steps. And you just click a few things uh, on a UI, and it does all even all of those things for you. So that that's something we're considering doing uh, as part of the solution, and also baking in some of those integrations. So if you want to integrate with, let's say, Azure Active Directory, you you don't need to do all of that manually. You could have at least the initial setup auto-generated for you. Uh, similar thing for VMs, right? So uh, if you're run, wanting to run uh, WebSphere ND on, uh, on, on, on Azure and you have, let's say, uh, a, a 10 cluster setup or you know, even a 40 cluster uh, web, WebSphere cluster setup, it's a lot of manual work to do all of that. Right? So similarly, uh, you can apply Azure ARM templates and that Azure Marketplace capability to spin that up very easily. Right? Just to say, hey, I want a WebSphere cluster uh, give me 10 instances and front end it with uh, you know Azure Native Load Balancer, point and click, and you know in a, in a matter of let's say half hour, a couple of hours at max, you you can get your uh, your uh, VM set up all all up and going, and then you can further modify that. So all of that is uh, things we are considering. Uh, and as uh, Graham mentioned, really at this point, what we really need is actually engagement uh, from customers to figure out. What is actually the right thing? What what is what is required? What is helpful? Uh, yeah, I think we can we can uh, go to uh, Q and A, uh, Graham. Okay. Um, so Res has mentioned uh, or answered the first question we have, which was, is it is it an OpenShift operator? So it as as he said, it works in in vanilla Kubernetes environment. There are a couple of capabilities as part of the operator that are specific to OpenShift. So if you use the operator in OpenShift, there are additional capabilities that in, in, integrate with um, OpenShift capabilities. But you can also use the same open uh, same Open Liberty operator in in a in a Kubernetes environment. Um, next question was, since we have the cloud packs, do we have any plans to integrate Transformation Advisor to OpenShift? Um, I'm not sure what integration um, that's referring to. We have, uh, so Transformation Advisor runs in containers, uh, so we'll run in an OpenShift environment if you want to use Transformation Advisor there. Um, but you can also run what we call TA local. So as long as you've got uh, a local um, container environment, you can run TA on, on your local uh, local desktop laptop. Yep, and we're also looking into um, making that executable in, a, in an Azure environment as well. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, All right, I think I, we're good to go. Thank you for joining, thank you.